Number 10, the Keg Mansion in Toronto. This one's for me, I'm so sorry, but here it is. Tell anyone in Toronto that you're going to the Keg Mansion for dinner, be ready to receive the, you know it's haunted, right? Because they will do that, they will do that. Because it is. I have been there on several occasions and I can verify that heading to the upstairs girls bathroom alone is a harrowing journey. The haunting goes back all the way to 1915. Before it was the keg, it was the home of industrialist Hart Massey and his family. Legend has it that the Massey's daughter Lillian passed away and her maid was so distraught over her death that she took her own life. That's one theory. Others say that she committed the act to avoid the dread of her affair with Massey being revealed. Either way, the ghostly image of a maid hanging by the neck has been seen multiple times by employees, I have friends who work there, and guests alike. It's been a keg since the 1970s, and Ed Lorraine never visited, neither for business or pleasure. There are either two reasons for this, they were too busy, or the idea of a ghostly apparition appearing mid-bite didn't sound very appealing to them. How do you like your spirit? Rare or well done? Number eight, Velisca Axe House. Adding to this list of properties that make you want to run away is the Velisca Axe House. The story goes as follows. On June 10, 1912, Josiah and Sarah Moore, along with their children, were bludgeoned to death inside their home. But no one knows who did it. It is one of America's most infamous cold cases, and the home remains preserved exactly as it was, except for the bodies, obviously. Though many report that their spirits remain. The Warrens never charged for their work. They simply liked helping people because go Warrens. But the people who now run the haunted museum have no problem charging their visitors. The house remains a tourist attraction and there's a steep price to pay should you wish to stay the night. Besides the $400 fee, it may cost you your life. Allegedly in 2014, a paranormal reporter stayed at the house and at 12.45 in the morning, the owners got the call. The man was found covered in stab wounds, which authorities later reported were self-inflicted. The Warrens risked their well-being all the time. So my theory is that the investors were the ones that kept them away because they didn't want to scare the ghosts away because they were making them so much money, but you know, it would have been nice to hear their thoughts. Number seven, Los Feliz Mansion. Have you ever entered a room or building that immediately gave you like the heebie-jeebies, like something in your gut was screaming at you that you were supposed to be there? Well, that is the exact feeling people encounter when they stand outside this mansion. On the night of December 6, 1959, Dr. Harold Perelson snapped and took the life of his wife and eldest daughter before he took his own. His two youngest managed to escape after their eldest sister screamed. He was a successful doctor with a happy family life, so no one knew why this happened. Some blame financial issues after one of his investments failed, but one creepy factor was that a passage from Dante's Divine Comedy was left open on his bedside table like a note. Ever since the event, people report an overwhelming feeling of foreboding that prevents visitors from entering. It was used as a storage unit by a family who purchased it two years after the event, but it was never lived in again. Number 5, 455 Sackett Street. When you think of a haunted house, a specific image appears in your brain. It's either a farmhouse or a mansion. There's really no in between. But you would think we would hear more about haunted apartment buildings since there is a large turnover, which is perhaps why the haunting of 455 Sackett Street didn't get as much attention. This place was riddled with unexplained fires, ominous feelings and sudden drops in temperature, and family tragedies. Everyone who lived there experienced dark things. What with the history of the building being riddled with insidious affairs, mob hits and dealings and grim attacks? Bound to happen. Jane, one of the women who lived there, once had a friend see a little boy in burnt rags staring at her. This event proved even more terrifying as after the woman moved out, the apartment was renovated. Within the walls of her apartment, they found a corpse fitting the above description, tucked inside the walls. So if you are ever in Brooklyn, don't request an in-person viewing. The Warrens never did. Number four, Hotel Monte Vista. We all know the idea of a place being haunted is enough to lure in guests, but if guests can't even make it through the night, then there's a problem. And they needed the Warrens, but they never showed up. The Hotel Monte Vista opened as a community hotel in 1927, and soon a history of opium dens, tragic affairs, mob dealings, once again, and secret gambling swelled around the place, as did their paranormal reputation. The hotel has become known for its ghostly sightings, such as in room 220. A 
long term boarder had a strange habit of hanging meat from the ceiling in that room. I don't know why the hotel let them do that. And the lodger himself was found dead three days after his death. The TV allegedly changes channels on its own, and the sheets have been found torn to shreds. In room 210, the small voice of a bellboy announcing room service can be heard, though no one appears. John Wayne even experienced this. In room 306, the corpses of two women of the night were thrown over the balcony. Guests who stay there report feelings of being suffocated by hands while they sleep. Staff are plagued by sounds of infants crying in the basement and have been seen running to escape the sound. The list goes on and on. Perhaps it was more the money machine that kept the Warrens away, but it would have been cool to hear their take on the hauntings. Number 3 Povelia Island There are many reasons why the Warrens never visited this island, the number one being that it's so freaking terrifying it's actually illegal to visit. It's also in Italy, though they traveled all the time, so what's the reason? Povelia Island Place hosts over 160,000 violent deaths. From being a hospice for victims during the bubonic plague, then an asylum run by a mad doctor, the tormented past of the island has no limits. The story of the doctor on the island is the most menacing though. He performed cruel and malicious experiments on his patients, but their souls took revenge on him and allegedly drove him mad. So mad that he tried to throw himself off of the clock tower. And witnesses say that on the night it happened, a mysterious mist consumed the island. Those who decide to take a boat and venture as close as possible to it report hearing screams and moans that chill the bones. Even creepier, people report hearing a bell toll from across the bay, even though it was removed years before. Scientists who have studied the strange happenings of Povelia have identified an electromagnetic field that surrounds the property, but there's no electricity to the island, so what's the reason? Number 2 The Dandy House this may have been a job too big for the dynamic duo. A dream home turned nightmare, the Dandies experienced some of the most terrifying encounters since the Bell Witch. I said it. Clara and Phil Dandy lived in this house along with their kids in the 1970s and endured all kinds of encounters. From disembodied voices to footsteps racing around the house, it's a wonder they stayed as long as they did. The creepiest thing I saw described is that once they witnessed strange faces watching them through the windows. When Mr. Dandy ran outside to confront them, first of all, brave dude, badass, mad respect, the faces were looking out at him from inside the house. From there things got worse. Some of the things even sounded like aliens. They saw floating white specters and half animal half human creatures watching them. Objects flew around the room, one lamp barely missed one of their daughters. They involved clergy and Ed and Lorraine to help clear the house, but even they couldn't rid the house of whatever possessed it. In fact, whatever they did made it worse. It got so bad, the dandies ended up leaving the house after nothing worked. And last but not least, the Mothman in number one. The legend of the Mothman, alien, angel or demon, described as a tall half man half bird like creature with glowing eyes, the Mothman even has skeptics unsure of what to say. The most famous groupings of sightings occurred between November 15th, 1966 to December 15th in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Prophetic in nature, sightings of the creature are often followed by tragic events such as the Silver Bridge disaster. The aforementioned bridge collapsed on December 15th which coincided with the last sighting of the creature. 46 people passed away and because sightings ceased after this, people believe he was an angel of death of sorts. More recently, sightings of the Mothman started taking place in 2011 in Chicago. I know the Warrens strictly dealt with demons and possession, but considering how mystifying this whole event was, it would have been interesting to hear what they had to say. Number 10. We're starting off strong with the Devil Made Me Do It case. If you're a fan of Ed and Lorraine, you know this one. The Devil Made Me Do It case is arguably one of the most famous cases that Ed and Lorraine ever worked on. But beyond the supernatural, this case was right in the public eye. Not only were there demons in the supernatural, but the scrutiny of the public eye made this a whole different monster for the Warrens. A bunch of people outside of the courthouse making claims and threats over the case isn't easy to deal with. When 19 year old Arne Cheyenne Johnson took the life of his landlord and blamed it on the devil, Ed and Lorraine jumped to his defense. They were convinced a demon had entered him after he tried to save his brother from a vicious possession a year earlier. His younger brother was possessed by 43 demons and Arne commanded that they leave him and enter him instead. The Warrens fell under immense scrutiny but according to them, the court the court had defended accounts of God in the past, now it was time to defend accounts of the devil. But one thing remains strange to me. Arne was never exercised after the event. Does that mean they are still with him? Number 9 Highgate Cemetery where were they for the vampire hysteria at Highgate Cemetery? Like, Where were you? When I learned about this case, I was 
flabbergasted and it's weird to me that they weren't there. They dealt with werewolves but missed out on vampires completely? The Highgate Cemetery in London, England has some of the oldest graves in the world, making it the perfect breeding ground for ghosts, ghouls, goblins and vampires. Ooh, it's spooky season. The Highgate vampire case caused a media uproar in the 60s that culminated in two magicians magicians facing off to see who could catch the vampire first. It all started when two girls reported seeing the dead rise from the graves while walking through Swain Lane one night. Soon animal carcasses drained of blood started turning up. Newspapers had their cameras ready. A massive vampire hunt was organized on Friday, April 13th, Friday the 13th, in 1973. And bodies were even exhumed from their graves to see if they were toothy. Sadly, no one caught anything, but the case still sends a tingle down the spines of vampire enthusiasts around the world. Legends of the demon, though, continue along with sightings of a crazed old woman and corpses appearing in places they shouldn't be. Number 8. The Bell Witch I searched the internet far and wide to see if the Warrens had ever visited the Bell Farm, but alas, no. If I'm wrong and I missed something, post a link down in the comments because I'm not perfect and maybe I missed it. But as far as I can see, they never actually checked out one of the most famous hauntings in the world. 200 years later, the Bell Cave remains an attraction and many still report hearing a shrill, scratchy voice when no one is around and see orbs surrounding the farm, or where it used to stand. Though the actual events happened well before the time of the Warrens and the farm was torn down, the Bell Cave was still there. If there was any duo who could have proven the tale of the Bell Witch, it was them, but maybe, just maybe, they were afraid of what they might find. Number 7. Michael Taylor the Michael Michael Taylor case is one of the strangest I've ever come across while doing lists like this, and it certainly needed Ed and Lorraine. The horrifying events of Michael Taylor happened in the 1970s, specifically 1974. A man who was considered a good husband, father, and community man suddenly flipped. He began enduring bouts of severe depression and was visiting a 21 year old pastor named Marie Robinson for counsel. His wife was obviously suspicious, but the sessions were helping. Mary allegedly performed many exorcisms on him to expel the demons. Taylor's wife was getting pretty antsy and they ended up having a confrontation during which Taylor attacked his wife. It was after this moment Taylor resolved to undergo a full blown exorcism on October 5th, 1974. During this, Michael had seizures, he spit and bit the ministers and screamed in tongues. Unfortunately though, it did not expel all the demons and Taylor returned home in a rage. He took the life of his wife in an incredibly gruesome way and was later found screaming in the street naked and covered in blood. I don't I don't think the Warrens ever encountered anything as violent, but imagine if they did. Number 6. Richard Gallagher and Julia Richard Gallagher is a man I find entirely fascinating because his transition from being a man of science to a full on believer of the occult is, for lack of a better word, insane. Now obviously the Warrens had their domain, but imagine if these guys collaborated on this case? What? Though, I don't know if Gallagher needed that help. Saying. The case I'm referring to is when Gallagher encountered a transformative possession. Gallagher became the go-to guy to diagnose people who claimed to be possessed. An Ivy League psychiatrist, he would help those who were mistaking mental illness for something mystical. Julia was the first time he encountered someone he couldn't explain. Julia was the queen of a satanic cult and had become possessed, which she desperately wanted to be rid of. Skeptical at first, but when Richard sat down to talk to her, she knew intimate details about his life. Objects would fly off off the wall and once during a phone call with the priest, they both heard one of the demonic voices she'd speak in around them, even though Julia was across the country. Number 5. The Thornton Heath Poltergeist It was the 1970s. A. Thornton Heath, England. Where were the Warrens? Probably busy or too scared to bother with such a terrifying case. It all started one hot August evening when the family living in the house was awoken by their radio suddenly blaring to life. This was just the beginning to a terrible haunting the family would endure for four years. Objects would fall or be thrown across the room by invisible hands, you know, all the usual poltergeisty things. One night, the son awoke to find a man standing at the end of his bed, like staring at him with like venom in his eyes. After a bunch of startling incidents, they tried to have the house blessed. 
but it failed. However, a medium did discover that the house was haunted by a couple named the Chattertons, the Chattertons who considered them trespassers on their property. The family eventually had no other option but to move out and the activity has since ceased. But imagine if the Warrens were on the case, probably would have been solved so much sooner. Or not, who knows. Number 4. The Danny Poltergeist Case in 1998, a woman named Jane Fishman reported strange happenings regarding an antique bed in the home of Al Cobb in Savannah, Georgia. It was a vintage 1800s bed that Cobb bought at auction for his son, a purchase he later regretted. Three nights after it was purchased, Jason, the son, told his parents that someone was watching him on the bed. He felt cold breath on his neck and saw the impressions of elbows dipping into the pillow. He also noticed the photo of his deceased grandparents lying face down on the dresser, which became a reoccurring event after he put it back up, it fell back out. But then one morning, an assortment of strange objects, including animals made from shells, was found on his bed after he'd already gone down to breakfast. That got his parents and his twin brother's attention. They left paper and crayons out and asked the ghost what his name was. Then later they came back to see Danny 7 written on the paper. After several communications and a smashed terracotta planter, it was clear that Danny didn't want anyone in his bed. The family eventually got rid of the bed, but that didn't solve the problem. Turns out Jason's connection to the spirits went skin deep and he continued to see things after the event. Number 3, here we go. The Winchester House. This place is on my bucket list to visit, so it's a wonder to me why the Warrens never checked it out. Again, I googled it, they didn't, prove me wrong in the comments, I welcome correction as always, thank you. But it's essentially a 24,000 square feet mansion with 10,000 windows, 2,000 doors, 160 rooms, 52 skylights, 47 stairways and fireplaces, 17 chimneys, 13 bathrooms, 6 kitchens, and cost Sarah $5 million to build, about $71 million today. There are stairs and doors that lead to nowhere, windows that don't open, it's a labyrinth of mystery. Sarah Winchester and her husband William Winchester amassed a huge fortune from their sale of the, you guessed it, Winchester rifle. After her daughter died of TB and William left Sarah a widow, she consulted a medium who told her that she would constantly be haunted by the spirits killed by the Winchester rifle. The house never stopped construction until she died in 1922. It is said the house was built to trap the spirits inside. Today it's considered one of the most haunted places in the world and is well worth a visit for anyone seeking a scare. So where the heck were the warrants to debunk this thing? It would have been awesome. And now we are getting to number one. The warrants. Demons, poltergeists, and ghosts. It was hard to find a case that the warrants wouldn't face. They seemed fearless, their love strong enough to withstand all the forces of darkness, or at least that's how the movies told it. It turns out that the real case the Warrens were too afraid of was the horrifying truth of their marriage. Yup, we're going there. If you're a fan of the movie franchise, then you know that Lorraine had a lot of influence on the stories up until her death, but a weird detail in her contact alludes to some nefarious activity in their personal life. Neither Ed or Lorraine Warren could be depicted violating anyone or performing adult acts with a minor. The reason that was in there might have something to do with the case of Judith Penny. Penny stayed with the Warrens as a young woman and allegedly had an inappropriate relationship with Ed and Lorraine knew about it. Judith made a legal declaration in November 2014 stating that Penny and Ed had begun an amorous relationship when he was her bus driver and she moved in with them in 1963. That same year, Penny was arrested when someone noticed the illegal relationship between her and Ed. Why she was arrested and not him remains in question to me, but Penny also stated that Ed was abusive towards Lorraine, saying, and I quote, sometimes Ed would actually have to slap her across the face to shut her up. Some nights I thought they were going to kill each other. Lorraine denied the allegations through representatives and there are still a lot of loose ends, but I suppose whatever happened has already been taken to the grave. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have The Conjuring. To start off this list today, of course, we have to talk about the case that really started a lot of our more modern interest in Ed and Lorraine cases, and that would be The Conjuring House. The house, which was built in 1736, wasn't anything special and didn't gain its fame until the family of Roger and Carolyn Perrone moved in in 1971. They 
They claimed to experience terrible things like the smell of rotting flesh, witnessing something levitate in their beds as they slept, and one of the family members even claimed to have been possessed by a spirit. The family, of course, called Ed and Lorraine to come and investigate and hopefully help them out. Once there, the pair claimed that there was in fact a spirit haunting the home, and it was that of Bathsheba Sherman, who was said to have been a witch who previously lived in the house and who was buried in a cemetery nearby. The investigators had to make several trips to the house over the span of a few years, but as of now, it is said that the house belongs to new owners who continue to open their doors to paranormal investigators. In our number 9 spot today, we have Annabelle. Many of us are likely quite familiar with Annabelle due to the movies made about the haunted doll. As it turns out though, they truly are more than just movies as the real story is said to have taken place in the 1960s. This is at least when Ed and Lorraine began to get involved with the doll. In 1968, two roommates claimed that the Raggedy Ann doll that was gifted to one of them by their mother had become possessed by the spirit of a young girl named Annabelle Higgins. After further investigation by the pair, the Warrens explained that the doll was being manipulated by an inhuman presence and they knew that the roommates would not be able to keep the doll without fearing for their safety. This is what led to the pair taking the doll and placing it in their occult museum. In our number 8 spot today, we have Amityville. One of the cases that is perhaps the most famous of Ed and Lorraine's is that of the Amityville haunting. In the 1970s, couple George and Kathy Lutz contacted the paranormal pair because they claimed that their house was haunted by some sort of violent, demonic presence. They said that this presence was so intense it forced them to have to leave their home. Considering the dark history this home had just before the couple had moved in, it wasn't necessarily a stretch to believe that the house was haunted by some sort of evil spirit. In the end, the Warrens investigated the home and backed up claims that the Lutz had, which is part of the reason why this case ended up launching its own multi-million dollar franchise afterwards. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Enfield Poltergeist. In 1977, the Warrens were called to Enfield, which is said to be a North London suburb, over reports of some poltergeist activity. Many people claimed that the reports of the hauntings were a hoax, but when the Warrens conducted their investigations, they became convinced that the hauntings were a result of demonic possession. The claim said that the house had furniture that moved on its own, there were disembodied voices being heard throughout the halls, and just general haunting things that nobody would want in their home. In the end, this case was so famous, it's actually what went on to inspire the story that was seen in The Conjuring 2. In our number 6 spot today, we have The Devil Made Me Do It. This is the Ed and Lorraine Warren story that is behind the 2021 Conjuring movie. We've got a lot of fucking Conjuring movies on this list. In 1981, Arn Johnson was accused of taking the life of his landlord, Alan Bono. Ed and Lorraine had been called to the house prior to this taking place because the family believed that the younger brother of Arn's fiance had been possessed by a demon, but when the paranormal investigations began, Ed and Lorraine claimed that Arn was also possessed by some sort of demon. The trial of Alan's killing ended up marking a point in time as it was the first time demonic possession was used as a not guilty plea. In this case, it was unsuccessful, but it went on to be one of the most historic cases of Ed and Lorraine's. In our number 5 spot today, we have the werewolf. Okay, I'll be honest, this is one of the more controversial Ed and Lorraine cases, but still, we had to talk about it. Ed and Lorraine claimed that they were able to exercise the angry spirit of a werewolf from a man named Bill Ramsey, who is said to have turned into a sort of wolf man. The Warrens did not perform exorcisms themselves, so of course they needed to get some help from priests as well, but they claimed that the treatment worked. Lorraine explained that she saw Ramsey's case on TV and just felt like she could help him. She even claimed to have a video of this guy transforming into the werewolf creature, but conveniently never released it to the public. The Warrens were so involved in this case that they brought Bill from England back to Connecticut in order to be exorcised by a bishop that they knew and trusted. In our number 4 spot today, we have the Union Cemetery. The Union Cemetery in Easton, Connecticut is known as one of the most haunted cemeteries in the United States, which definitely says a lot. The most famous of all of its hauntings is a presence that is often referred to as the White Lady. There are many people who have experienced this ghostly presence, and many people have seen her walking in front of their cars as they drive near the cemetery. That is all exactly why, in 1990, the Warrens decided to experience it for themselves when they set up their cameras in this haunted location. It is said that just after 2.40am, they heard the sound of weeping, and a paranormal figure began to move several feet in their direction. It is said that as they witnessed this, Ed tried to slowly approach her, but she suddenly vanished just as quickly as she had appeared. In our number 3 spot today, we have the Smurl House. In August of 1973, the Smurl family had moved into a new home in West Pittston, Pennsylvania, 
but things quickly took quite a dark turn. The family began to claim that their new home was possessed by some sort of a demon that caused loud noises and bad odors and whatever this entity was, it was doing some really violent things to the family as well as to their pet dog. This went on for years before they decided to call in the pros, of course Ed and Lorraine were on the case. According to Ed, there was a demon that inhabited the home and it was very powerful. It had the ability to shake mirrors and other items of furniture and they began trying to persuade it to leave by playing religious music and praying. Apparently the Warrens, while in the home, witnessed a drop in temperature which was followed by the formation of a sort of dark mass. There was another instance where they claimed they saw the demon leave a message on a mirror that read, get out. In our number 2 spot today we have The Haunting in Connecticut. If you've ever seen or read The Haunting in Connecticut, this is a home and a story that you might be a little familiar with. In 1986, the Snedecker family moved into a new rental home that at one time had previously been a funeral home. In the basement, the family found some less than welcoming items that were left from the home's previous life. Shortly after moving in, however, their discoveries would become more gruesome as they began to have reports of evil coming from the house. These included attacks on the family members, seeing apparitions, and they even explained violent personality changes from one of the family members. When Ed and Lorraine investigated the house, they were able to confirm that it was in fact haunted. It is said that one of the most frightening things that took place in the house, aside from the rumors of possession, was one day when a family member was mopping the floor and all of a sudden the water suddenly turned blood red. In our number one spot today we have the Donovan family. In the early 1970s, the Warrens were called to the home of the Donovan family and when they arrived they found them all terrified. They witnessed loud pounding and other inhuman noises coming from inside of the walls. The wallpaper was peeling and the water was running red. The Warrens began their investigation and this included asking them questions to try and find out if there was a source for the haunting, such as a recently passed away family member or some kind of new secondhand item that they had inherited. Through this questioning, it was revealed that one member of the family had used a Ouija board and ended up contacting someone who said that they had died in the neighborhood 10 years earlier. The Warrens knew it was time for them to call a priest because they believed that the entity that had been reached through the Ouija board was actually a demon that was just posing as the person who had passed away. Following an exorcism, it is said that things in the home slowly returned to normal, but the events stayed with the entire family. One member who witnessed the hauntings and the exorcism said, quote, I nor anyone else in my family have ever before witnessed anything so weird and terrifying. <laughs> 